July could be the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. With days to go, climate researchers say it's likely July 2023 will go down as the hottest month of the last 120,000 years. And with that prediction comes a very stark reminder of the price we pay when the world warms. Children swept away by monsoon rains, families running from the flames, workers collapsing in scorching heat. For vast parts of North America, Asia, Africa and Europe, it's a cruel summer. For the entire planet, it is a disaster. So remember, we started the month hitting a world record. July 6th, the average temperature was 17.08 degrees Celsius. That was 0.2 degrees warmer than the July 2019 record. CTV's Heather Butts joins me now with more on the story. And Heather, people here in Toronto can certainly feel the heat, and we're not the only ones. Morella, it has been a very hot and humid day here in Toronto. This city, as well as many others in Ontario and Newfoundland, under heat alerts today. The temperature hovering near 30 degrees in Toronto, feeling closer to 40 with the humid X. And if that sounds familiar, well, that's because so many cities across this country have been hitting temperature records all summer long. Many cities enduring that heat and humidity reaching near 40 degrees especially at the beginning of July. And we're certainly not alone. Countries around the world are sweltering under blistering temperatures and the oceans have heated to unprecedented levels. And that has scientists saying today that July will be the planet's hottest month ever. And July isn't even over. So they're saying that temperatures for the first 23 days of July averaged 16.95 degrees Celsius, well above the previous record of 16.63 Celsius. And scientists say they're certain these temperatures are the warmest the planet has seen in 120,000 years. Now, this is, of course, affecting the record wildfires that we're seeing in Canada, as well as those around the globe. It's impacting farming and our food producers. And tragically, it has led to dozens of deaths around the globe. The UN saying today climate change is here. It is terrifying and it is just the beginning. Morella. CTV's Heather Butts in Toronto. Let's bring into a conversation Blair Feltmate, head at Intact Center on Climate Adaptation at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. Thank you for your time. So likely the hottest July ever recorded, but when did we actually start recording temperatures roughly? Uh, well, well over 100 years, uh, we've been keeping uh, 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 world temperature records. And uh, so when we uh, make statements pertaining to uh, setting a new record, that is well founded based on the historical record. Okay, but they're also talking about it being the hottest month in 120,000 years. So if records only go back 100 years, how is that determined? Uh, you can look at uh, fossil uh, tree uh, ring data. You can look at uh, pollen assemblages in, in lakes. You can look at gas assemblages uh, uh, in uh, the lower depths of glaciers. And there's so there's a variety of tools that in science we can use to determine uh, what were the temperatures on the planet very, very long times, you know, very long ago. Uh, uh, well beyond just the written record that we've been keeping for over 100 years. Okay, so Blair, let's talk about where we are today. Uh, is the process speeding up? Was it expected to be this hot in Canada and around the world this summer? Uh, I don't know about this summer, but if you look at uh, predictions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, predictions laid out in Canada's Changing Climate Report, written by Environment and Climate Change Canada in 2019. Uh, predictions made by the World Meteorological uh, Association. Uh, all of them have consistently predicted that we're going to experience more uh, extreme heat on the planet going forward. And, and we are seeing it in, in real time. And indeed, it's really on the upside of what the predictions are. Uh, but but what we're seeing is very consistent uh, with the warnings. Is, is the process speeding up at all? We heard from the UN chief today talking about how he feels like things have gone a lot faster. So I'm just wondering, is it getting hotter faster? Uh, the, uh, there's an upward bend in the curve 
in terms of heat. And there's an upward bend in the curve in terms of the expressions of flood, wildfire, extreme heat uh, that we are realizing around the world. And indeed, what we're seeing is that, uh, for example, if you look at catastrophic loss insurable claims, uh, uh, both in Canada and internationally, not only are the claims going up, but they're going up with an upward bend in the curve, which is reflecting the increasing frequency and intensity of extreme weather events being realized here in Canada and internationally. So th the short way of saying that is things are getting worse faster. Okay, let's get to Canada in a moment. I want to know about July because historically uh, we're looking at it as the hottest month in the world. But I'm just wondering, generally speaking, does July tend to be the hottest month for the world or, or is it August? Uh, it's, it's, any, it's June, July, August, basically. It could be any one in any particular year. But you're, you know, we're right in that zone of, of expectation of this is when we're going to get the extreme heat on a planetary basis. Got it. There have been heat waves in Europe, in North America and Asia. I'm just wondering if you can define what a heat wave is. Uh, there are different definitions pertaining to heat waves, but generally speaking, we're talking about three days in a row where the temperature doesn't drop below 30 degrees Celsius, even at night. Okay, and that sustained high temperature for three days or more, why aren't we seeing uh, more wind, more movement of wind to, to cool communities, to cool cities, to cool countries? Well, because we have a there's a certain certain stasis that enters into the system uh, related to the jet stream, where uh, uh, a particular weather system in an area stays put for an extended period of time, and with that staying put, if you will, that high pressure area, there tends to be less wind associated with it. So really, that's just the physical manifestation of the the, the dynamic of dynamics of airflow under uh, warmer uh, temperatures. Got it. High sea temperatures also contributing here. Is the sea warming up uh, earlier in the year? Or is it staying warmer for later in the year? Yeah, both. It, 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 both, uh, both of the factors you just named, yes. And how much of an effect does that have? Well, one of the problems is that to date, and as challenging as things may seem at the moment, a great deal of the elevated heat on the planet has been has been being stored in the oceans. And uh, but now, uh, as the oceans heat up, there's less and less capacity to hold that heat. So now it enters onto onto terrestrial systems, onto land systems. So going forward, expressions of extreme heat are going to be increasingly so challenging. Interesting. So it actually holds on to the heat and gets to a point where it has to basically throw it back on land? Yeah, you can only heat, it, it, you can, the, the more heat you have in the system, the, the, the less its absorptive capacity. And uh, so the heat has to go somewhere. So where does it go? It goes into the atmosphere and then transfers onto the land. Okay, how does El Nino contribute? Well, uh, on a frequency of about two to 10 years, and there's variance here, uh, we can see a reversal in wind flow in the Pacific Ocean that normally goes from east to west. It can reverse and go from west to east. And when it does so, it brings the warm water, the warm air associated with the warm water in the western Pacific uh, uh, to the uh, uh, western end of the North American continent, uh, North American continent and South American continent, causing heating uh, during one of these events. And they happen on about every two to 10 years, somewhere in that zone. Because you study this, I'm just wondering what is it like for you to see these temperature readings, to watch what's going on? Uh, it's all pretty consistent with what we've been uh, uh, talking about um, and predicting and you know, giving presentations on to limitless bodies over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. But it's not just extreme heat. There are really about 10 categories of climate change extreme weather risks that increasingly so are proving to be problematic, not just in Canada, but internationally. So it's flood, drought, fire, hail, wind, snow load, permafrost loss, sea level rise, contraction of Arctic ice expansion, and extreme heat. One way or another, for all 10 of those factors that I just named, uh, we're seeing new records being set. Today we're talking about extreme heat, but 
all of these factors are setting uh, uh, new records in terms of impact, and they will continue to go uh, to do so going forward. Because as bad as things are now, for sure, they're going to get worse going forward. Climate change is irreversible, period. The most we can do is slow it down. We cannot stop it. So that's why we have to prepare for extreme heat or wildfires or, or flooding and uh, other factors. And we need to do so very rapidly. Let's get to how we move forward in a moment. Canada and Greece have had quite an extreme wildfire season. This was mentioned in a report by researchers today looking at the forecast for July and ahead. Uh, our country's had more than 4,700 fires burned so far. 120,000 square kilometers of land burned. And, of course, we've seen the historic flooding. You mentioned flooding in Nova Scotia recently. Why is Canada feeling the effects this way? It seems more so than some other countries. Yeah, I'm not sure it's more so, but we're certainly feeling it. That, that's for that's for sure. And uh, uh, in central to western Canada, uh, has been well modeled by Environment and Climate Change Canada under global warming, extreme heat. We are uh, the predictions are for more forest fires to occur, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, in uh, central to eastern Canada, the predictions are for more water coming down over shorter periods of time contributing to flooding, and that's what we're seeing. And, and by the way, that's not to say you can't have flooding in the west or fires in the east. But generally speaking, uh, uh, the, what we're seeing in terms of the wildfires, extreme heat, and the floods in the country, uh, it's consistent with uh, modeling that's been well developed in this country and available for a number of years. We talked about some of the things that feed into uh, global warming. We know emissions, of course, primarily to blame. Are there any factors that we missed? Not really. The, I mean, the biggest challenge that we're facing or the biggest driver in the system is we're adding about two parts per million CO2 into the atmosphere on, a, on an annual basis. And, uh, and, and the more CO2, carbon dioxide, that we concentrate in the atmosphere, the greater the degree to which heat that would otherwise escape into space, uh, it gets trapped in the system. It's almost like a blanket around the earth and that's contributing to warming. And for the foreseeable future, uh, that trend in uh, terms of elevated CO2 uh, concentration, you know, I, that's not gonna turn around for the foreseeable future. So we've heard the calls as you, as you alluded to time and time again, reduce emissions, reduce emissions, get them down. We also know it's a very slow turning ship. What would we have to do today to feel any near-term relief? Well, uh, in terms of electricity production around the world, or in Canada, make a contribution as well, uh, we, we want to turn to forms of electricity production that are less fossil fuel based uh, uh, and for overall energy supply. But the reality is at this moment, about 79, 80% of world energy supply at this moment comes from more or less about a third, a third, a third, coal, oil, and natural gas. Three fossil fuel based sources that when they're burned, they release CO2 into the atmosphere. So as uh, Antonio Guterres you know, was warning about in, your opening, in the opening remarks, we need to, to move much, much more quickly to, to get to, to move to other forms of energy, solar, wind, nuclear power, uh, uh, embrace these other forms of energy production that are less, that are not fossil fuel dependent. Are there other things we can do to prepare our communities, our, our cities, even our countrysides for this kind of effect, whether it be infrastructure changes or moving populations from one spot to another? Absolutely. Uh, in Canada, we have extremely good guidance on what to do at the level of the home and at the level of the community to lessen the impacts of uh, wildfire uh, affecting homes and communities burning when, when wildfires occur, uh, to limit those impacts significantly, well below what then that which we're realizing now. There's a lot of things you can do to prepare your house so that it doesn't burn down when fire comes through a region. There's a great deal that we could be doing that we're not doing to limit the, uh, the effects of, of, of major precipitation events uh, resulting in uh, flooding basements. Uh, and and the, these are actions that can be taken at the level of the house and the community. For example, uh, flooding. Uh, what we need to do is bring Canada's flood risk maps up to date to delineate where is water going to go in communities when the big storms hit. And then when we know that, 
we can uh, deploy berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, bioswales to direct water to safe locations and keep people and property out of harm's way. There's a lot we can do around a house or in, in the basement itself to lower the prob probability that when these big storms hit, uh, a homeowner doesn't end up with a flooded basement. For example, and it can be as simple as, for example, if you have a sub pump in your basement, a sump well that water would go into if water happened to get into the basement, check your sub pump to make sure that it works ahead of the storm, uh, rather than finding out you know, in the aftermath that it was seized and now you have three and a half feet of sewer water in your basement. Yeah. There's a great deal that we could be doing in this country to prepare for flooding, wildfire and extreme heat that we're not doing. We have the solutions, but we're not deploying them. That's the problem. Let me touch on maps for a moment. You mentioned updating those maps. Are they generally routinely updated? No, no. The Canada's flood risk maps are about, on average, 20 to 25 years out of date for most cities, period. 20 and, to 25 uh, years. That is correct. Okay, so they're in dire need of updating. That is correct. And and uh, so by and 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 we need these things to be brought up to date because if you're building, if you're a, a builder, a community, and you you're looking at building a new community somewhere, uh, you want to make sure that you don't build it in in a location that is currently pl prone to flooding, but also you want to anticipate the. Uh, future potential flooding. Because just because an area right now uh, may not be prone to flooding, when you build houses that are going to be there, a subdivision that's going to be there 25, 50, 75 years from now, although it may be in a location that's safe today, you want to make sure that it's not going to be in harm's way 25 or 30 years down the road. So you want to use modeling uh, to, to determine what that probability would be for flooding in an area. And, th and then avoid building there if indeed it does look flood prone, or if you do build there, you put all the measures in place to make it such that when the big storms occur, uh, everybody isn't flooded out. Yeah, so a lot of work to be done just at the ground level. Yes, and but the good news is, we know what to do in Canada. We actually have the tools, we have the standards, we have the guidelines. The problem is in Canada, we're not deploying these uh, best practices nearly fast enough. That's the problem in, uh, in uh, reference to being prepared for flooding and wildfire, which are the two most financially costly impacts of climate change in Canada. And extreme heat is the most lethal. It's the one that when it goes wrong, people die. Yeah, maybe those are the lessons we learn this summer, this season. Blair Feltman, good to have you on the show, sir. Thanks for your time today. Appreciate that. Oh, thank you very much.